Welcome to Bigfoot and Paranormal Encounters Podcast. From ghosts, UFOs, dogman, medical miracles, and other strange encounters of the unknown. Every Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. live, Facebook and YouTube. Here's the elusive big guy himself, your host, Dave Wagner. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Bigfoot and Paranormal Encounters podcast. Uh, we had some technical issues earlier, but uh, hopefully we have it all straightened out, and uh, we got a great show for uh, the listeners tonight. Uh, I'm going to bring my two guests in uh, in a moment. Uh, tonight's show is about sightings, the TV show that first aired on October 17th, 1992, my gosh, I was 29 years old then. I'm um, 50 now. 59, I'm sorry, now. And uh, wiping dust off of me. I'll be 60. <laughs> but uh, the show, it aired until September 11th, 1997. And that was a total of 87 episodes and six specials. So I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to go bring in our two guests, but before I do that, uh, guest number one uh, is Mr. Al Rober, who was a consultant for uh, the show's sightings. Uh, he's a great EVP specialist slash paranormal investigator, and uh, our second guest is Mike Burns. He was one of the producers for the TV show's sightings. And uh, he's also produced The Scariest Places on Earth and a couple other uh, uh, TV shows as well. So let's go bring in our guest. Eureka. Hey, Al. How about that? (laughs) Hi, guys. Guys, I want to... Nice to be among the living. (laughs) Guys, I want to thank you both for for being a guest on the show tonight. It's an honor to have you both on. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start with a uh, House of Plenty. Al, tell us a little bit about uh, House of Plenty. House of Plenty um, was actually the last show I did for sightings. Um, for a while, I didn't work for sightings. I had a little disagreement with them, and uh, uh, but I, I did, you know, come back and did some some great shows with them. But House of Plenty was a, a really good show because um, um, it took place down in Port Tobacco. It was an old plantation house, if I remember, in Port Tobacco, and uh, Michael produced the show, which made it excellent an excellent show right to begin with. He, he did a great job. And um, one of the best, probably the best producer I worked with at sightings. And I'm not doing, just blowing smoke up your ass either. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really did. He really did a great job. Um, huh. And matter of fact, he told me at one point. See if you remember this, Michael. You told me that yeah. you were referring. You referred to this show as your platinum show because you had myself, uh, Bill Roll, and Peter James on the same show. Yeah. With no, the- that was. That was, it was, you're right. I mean, it was, that was, that ended up being, for me at least, my absolute favorite show that I did uh, for sightings. And it was really, really nice because it just, it's, it felt to me at the time like it checked all the, all the boxes, you know, it was really a very compelling story. And uh, yeah, I mean, what, you know, what that family was dealing with was, uh, was pretty, Pretty out there, and 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 then once we dug a little deeper and did some of the backstory on that, it was really very very compelling. I mean, you, you it's hard to argument. It was hard to you know argument the, the facts that that there absolutely was kind of a, a checkered past there, and that the um, the all of the things that were happening in the house were verified when we got there. I felt at least you know. Yeah. So, yeah, but it, was, Beverly, it was really great, really amazing segment. 
the backstory was um, a woman named Beverly Eric, I guess, had contacted sightings. And um, she had always dreamt about this certain house. Um, she didn't know where, but, you know, for years she was dreaming about this house and this person, actually. Um, and uh, I guess she, when she was looking for a place to rent, um, down in Port Tobacco, she came upon um, this gentleman and she, and he showed her the house that he was renting. And apparently the house was a house that she'd been dreaming about for years. And the gentleman happened to be the man, looked very much like to her, like the man in her dreams that she had been um, seeing for years. And um, so when we uh, when we did get there, um, it was it was interesting because uh, first of all I was working with uh, a dear friend of mine and um, probably the you know number one parapsychologist in the world I'll say that and Bill Roll and uh, Bill and I had a lot of the same ideas. Um, one thing that I, that I always did when I went to a house in an investigation, one of the first things I would do would be to go around the house um, and. Uh, just to see what the, elect the uh, electromagnetic fi magnetic fields were in different areas of the house, because I've come to know in my uh, 45 or so years of doing this type of work that um, normally areas where your magnetic fields are the highest, they're the areas that you're going to have activity. Uh, and the areas that I picked up coincidentally are areas that I also picked up voices in the house in those areas. Um, when Bill Roll went through the house, he picked up the same spots. And, uh, and Peter James, when he came in, uh, he picked up the, the same spots. And um, a couple of incredible things. I did get a couple of voices in the house um, in uh, the one or the daughter of Alethea's room. Um, I got a, a, what sounded like a male voice pleading, saying, please, please, which came out very clear. It was a class A voice. Um, but the second voice that sightings didn't use, because it wasn't a class A voice, but was re remarkable, and I'll tell you why. Um, up in the bedroom upstairs, in front of the fireplace, which was also a hot spot in the house, they had a lot of activity in that room. Um, I got a, a weird voice saying, um, "Ribby, how are you? Ribby or Rebby, how are you?" Um, and it was weird, but it was the same room where apparently a doctor had lived years ago, and his ill wife had been lived in that same room. Um, her name was Mary, I believe. But um, you know, I picked up this voice, and I didn't tell anybody about the voice. Uh, I, when I left the house about four or five in the afternoon for a flight, Peter James came into the house at seven o'clock, I think, at night. And the first thing he picked up, Michael told me this the next day. The first thing he picked up when he walked into the house was, "Does anybody know a Ribby or a Rebby?" You know. Yeah. Which is yeah. incredible that he, that he got on. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, and and just to add to that, you know, we when we used to send Peter out and 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 Al as well, you know, it's like we would really go out of our way to try to keep them in the dark because we didn't want them to come in with any preconceived notions as to what the history in the house was, who lived there, what happened like nothing, you know, and we really went and, and Peter was, Peter was a bit of a rascal in that he would absolutely try to set traps to where you would maybe give him a hint as to, you know, what, uh, what the, what the backstory of the, of the shoot was, but son of a gun, you know, we, for that one, he knew nothing. And, it's like when he, I remember picking him up at the airport and bringing him there for day one, man, it, 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 like he clutched the, the, the door panels as if you would, like you were about to go into an accident. And I said, what's the matter? Because we were driving up that long driveway. Remember how long that driveway was? Yep. You know, there was a true like plantation set up and long driveway leading up to the main house. And he's like grabbing the straps on the car and he's like, Jesus. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, there's, he said, there's like slaves everywhere in the front of this house. And that for me, like kind of set the tone for, all right, this is, it's going to be interesting. Now in that area, you know, 
it wouldn't have been that hard to guess and think that maybe that, that place you know, would have been a, a plantation house back in the day. But he had very specific details about some of the, um, you know, the past owners of the house and, and people who lived there. And it was, it was uncanny to me. So, um, yeah, no, it was really, um, yeah, that was, it was just a power packed couple of days. You know, I, I couldn't believe that, uh, how busy they kept us with all the different things that were going on there. One of the things that Peter, I was, I was said, uh, I mentioned this to Dave too. Peter was made a made for TV psychic. He, uh, everything about him, he knew, uh, and that doesn't not to detract. I mean, he had, wonderful abilities i've worked with a lot of psychics and peter was very good um the late peter yeah. now unfortunately but peter was very good but when he got there there was an old oak tree in the in the yard do you remember that and he looked at the oak tree and he said there's somebody hiding behind this oak tree he's, he's coming out he says i could see a, a form by the oak tree and um beverly's husband uh, also mentioned he would come out side and he'd see somebody like hiding like ducking behind the oak tree he couldn't make out who it was well <laughs> overnight uh <laughs> overnight bill roll uh talked me into taking pictures every 15 minutes because <laughs> he was going to go home and sleep while i was up you know and uh, he had he talked <laughs> me into taking pictures with his camera of this uh of this oak tree at, at 15 minute intervals from i think it was from 12 I think it was from midnight to three in the morning. And, it's, and I did, I went out every 15 minutes, took a shot, every 15 minutes took another shot. At, um, at 1.30 in the morning, the picture I took at 1.30 in the morning, wouldn't you know, there's that vaporous form right next to the tree. Wow. Hey Al, let me see if I can, uh, I'm just gonna close my eyes for a second and think of uh, Peter James. I know he passed away in 2008. Uh, hello? Talk yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. That's him. That was, and, he that's had, him. And, he, and he had that, that great booming voice. I was like, yeah. talk Why to me. I'm not, I'm not afraid of you. Speak to me. You know? <laughs> that was him. That was yeah. him. God bless him. You know? um, and he became a very good yeah. friend. We kept in touch years later. I worked other cases with him, uh, as a matter of fact, yeah. sightings. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, we kept in touch for a long time, and then I was really saddened to hear that he passed away. Yeah, um, it's a shame. Yeah, he had very, he had really bad uh, emphysema. Like when we were when we were shooting uh, that weekend, Al. I don't know if you know this, but I mean, he was he was constantly hitting that puffer man. I mean, his yeah. his. his Sadly, his health was already starting to fail him. And such a nice guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, yeah, it was, it was sad to hear when he, when he passed. And um, I don't know, he, he, he put a lot of, he, he had, he had a, a lot, a high belief in my, my abilities, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he, he yeah. was good. Um, and he picked up other things. I mean, he picked up a number of things. Not only did he pick up, the woman Mary, by her name, Mary. Um, mm -hmm. He also picked up a, a slave uh, that was there, which you know, as uh, Mike said, you could. It was a plantation house, so you know, right. there were slaves there. Um, he picked up a, a couple of other things too. There was a um, a woman who had lived there, I guess, and uh, she had an experience on a staircase, as did Beverly of what appeared to be a, a Civil War soldier uh, appearing to him. And then uh, a woman appeared to her though, uh, also. And the woman had a, she was kind of overwhelmed by a scent, uh, like a, a perfume type of a scent, which happens in haunting cases. And uh, when Peter got there, he was suddenly overcome by the same scent. <laughs> you know, identified the same scent in the same area of the house. Um, so he did, he he was good. And, and then checking back, it, you know, there was apparently uh, this person, Mary, that lived there at a certain certain year. Um, I forget what the year was, but had had lived there, and um, and um, there was a, a case where there was a woman who had apparently uh, her actually it was her grandmother. They said that she had hit her head 
in the bathtub, and then she passed passed away shortly after. But uh, apparently, the family didn't believe it. They thought that there was uh, some foul play involved in it. Um, that was the woman Mary, who uh, she uh, identified in the bedroom. Um, so you know, it was a, it was a really uh, interesting um, investigation, yeah, and uh, right. I wish I could have been there longer, but. Um, you know, working a full-time job too and trying to run around society was tough. They would call me every time they, they got it. Every Monday, every Monday at um, my time in New Jersey, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, I'd get a call because they would just come out of their production meeting at that time. And uh, and they would review the haunting cases with me. Is this one worth doing anything? Is this one worth going out on? Um, can you do this one, you know? And uh, do you know somebody in this area, you know? And you know, it, I look forward to it. Actually, I look forward to the calls. Um, but uh, you know, it, it was uh, it was a, I thought it was one of the better shows that we did. Well, uh, you you had sent me a few EVPs. Can you uh, comment on that? Because I you know I can't play them until I until I get that straightened out. Um, I think it was like three of them. I, I remember. Uh, was one of them he or she's coming up the stairs or something like that? Yeah, that was a different case. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I think the EVPs I sent you were from um, Voices from Beyond. Beyond. Was, okay. uh, I That's think what it was. I, that was 95, I think. I filmed that one. Um, okay. And that, again, that was, that was more of a – that case was more of a threatening kind of a case. Um, in that there were happened to be actually two spirits in the house um, that okay. were scared. The house was in uh, Piscataway, New Jersey. Uh, a young family, there was a husband and wife, um, uh, two daughters, and a baby, uh, a granddaughter. Uh, the baby's name was Alyssa. And she would wake up screaming in the middle of the night, um, Bobby's here, Bobby's here. And she was only like two years old, you know. Um, okay. And apparently there was a spirit there uh, that uh, was, she was called Bobby, referred to as Bobby, who um, was, uh, he would, he would do, he was doing a lot of things in house. He would uh, start the, um, uh, the flame on the stove, suddenly come on and just like halfway to the ceiling. It was just, you know, huge flame in the stove. Um, one time uh, they, they, they sat there and they watched the, coffee pot in the coffee maker lift itself and drop right on the uh on the counter um i got a call one time at about 12 30 1 o'clock in the morning woke me up oh things are going nuts over here okay i'll be right there and uh, you know so i run over there and um uh apparently he had, he there was a stack of boxes that he had knocked across the room um, she tried to leave Tony, her, her name was Tony. She tried to leave the house, but he forced her back in. He wouldn't let her go. Like it was a force field at the door, um, would not let her uh, leave. And that night I was pretty pissed and, uh, I called him every name in the book and, uh, did a recording session. And, uh, that's when I got that voice. He's coming upstairs. Now the baby Alyssa was sleeping upstairs. We were downstairs, myself, Tony and her daughter. I said, let's ask this guy some questions, try to you know, get him out of here, calm him down. And um, there were two entities in the house. One we believe was like a warning entity. It may even have been related to Tommy, this a woman who seemed to be warning them whenever he was around. And we get this voice, he's coming upstairs. And you could actually hear footsteps on the tape, on the recording, and sightings did, did you that. You know, you could actually hear that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and the one daughter, uh, Amanda, was going to be moving out of the house that day. Now, of course, we didn't hear the voice until after we played the tape back. But um, mm -hmm. when I when I asked, um, "Are you upset because Amanda is is leaving? She was moving out." Right at that spot on the tape. He's demanding the baby is staying. And it's a very low uh, frequency voice, you know, kind of a threatening kind of a voice. 
he's demanding the baby is staying because the baby was his conduit. The baby was experiencing him. He was, you know, that was a connection. He was, he was coming to the baby. Um, she started calling him the bear. She started, uh, we think because um, we had a few sightings come in. One of them picked up that the house was sitting on a site of an old barn that had burned down and right. uh, someone had been burned in the, in the barn. And we believe that's who, this is who it was. Uh, we did check old um, maps from the period in the 1800s. And sure enough, there was a barn exactly on that spot. Um, mm -hmm. So we were, um, you know, we were building the blocks, you know, that you need um, right. to confirm that there's definitely something going on. It's definitely a horn thing there. At one point, uh, one of her friends, one of Tony's friends came in and uh, she, was a she was religious. And she said, let's just sprinkle holy water around and that'll calm things down. And she was uh, sprinkling holy water around. And as she did, something hit her hand and knocked the bottle of holy water across the floor. Um, wow. So, yeah, there's, there was uh, a lot of stuff going on in that house. Um, but it was, the kind, it was the kind of things that... Um, it was the kind of things that would could frighten you, certainly, obviously. Uh, some right. things that you didn't want to live with if you didn't have to. But uh, it was things that the family coped with all the time, you know, for that mm -hmm. whole time. They coped with what was going on. Three psychics came in. The first psychic, basically, um, all she picked up was the fire uh, that we were able to verify. Um, and that was... Uh Jane Dewitry or? Well, yeah, Jane, yes. That was Jane, yes. Um, I'm looking at some notes I have here. The uh, Okay, Al, Al, one, one second. Um, Mike, were you on location? Was I on location for what? For, I'm sorry, for then, uh, Voices from Beyond? Is that, yeah. No, 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 okay. no, no. I, um, I, you know, most of the, the lion's share of the time that I worked on, sightings i was in the office um i was a field producer so okay. the uh, we would send out field directors who kind of functioned as like field you know their own producers as well you know they were they were like they were dga directors and they were making really good money so they really made them earn their keep um so i only the only the reason house of plenty was different was because uh it was just so involved and as we started pumping, as we started, you know, it was like <clears throat> peeling back the layers of an onion. And as we started finding out more and more different story beats about what was going on there, um, we started then realizing that this could be a much bigger story than, than we initially thought it would be. And then as we started adding additional people like, you know, like, like William Roll and, and Al and then... Jeez, we had a, uh, we had a, uh, not, I want to say trans, not trans, not transgression. What would they call them, Al? There was a psychiatrist, yeah. there was like a psychologist that did like. Regression therapy. Pre regression therapy, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I want to say tr transgressions, which is, you know, that's me. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah, regression therapist. Uh, she came in. And, you know, we just had a, we had a, a few different people and then we had a couple of family members that we interviewed and then we found, I was able to track down some people that, that also lived there. So uh -huh. anyway, back to you to answer your question though. Uh, most of the time I was in the office, I set everything up in the office, but I'll tell you one of the reasons I think I did so well there is, and is because I, you know, my background um, I actually started out um, working with the writers on the original Cosby show um, in, in NBC in Brooklyn in the 80s. So, uh, and I've done some writing myself over the years. So I always had a really good idea and, and, uh, as far as like what made for a good story and what didn't. And I also found out which, um, which Peter actually told me over the phone, but it was only until we met uh, with House of Plenty and I went out for a meal with him that he pointed out, I guess, some things that 
I'd always kind of felt, but I didn't know, which was that I had some medium uh, tendencies as well, because I was very good at kind of sniffing out, you know, bullshit, part of my language. But, you know, if I had someone on the phone who I thought was complete quack and was just kind of leading us on, a lot of times I could, I could sift through it and I could just get a vibe from someone, even talking to them on the phone, whether I thought they were legit or not. And right. I... Uh, I got a pretty good reputation doing that. So they really liked me to basically pre-screen people, if you will, you know, do the pre-interviews, pre-screen, and then give the, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether I thought it was, you know, worthy of investing money and, you know, sending a crew out to, you know, shoot. Right. Um, so, but, but, but plenty became like, you know, four part series, which we'd never done before in sightings. And that, that was one thing I was really proud of the fact that never done a, a story that was that involved and that intricate. And, uh, and we just, you know, the goods were there. We came back with so much footage. It was obvious to us that it was going to you know, be more than just a, you know, two parter. Okay. So, yeah. Getting, you know, getting back to plenty, there was one, also one incident. I remember when, Peter said somebody was touching his head and you guys had yeah. thermal vision cameras there, right? And it showed yeah. blue as if some, right at that time, you could see the, uh, you know, yeah. the blue on it as something uh, cold was touching his head. Yeah, see, and, and, and yeah. right. And, and it was the day after that happened, Al, was when Peter and I went out to lunch and he sat there across from me and he said, he said, you realize, he says, you have the gift because I was the only one that could hear when that incident happened the night before. And we, we, um, Peter, he saw, he, he saw the, the, the spirit and at the time we didn't, we didn't have a name or anything, but he saw it and he was like calling it out saying, you know, make yourself known. I see you, you know, why are you here? Talk to me, talk to me. And and at one point there was a portal, I guess, so you know what you call it. And it was, and it was like Peter came out, Peter, and he was taught, he was communicating with this thing and no one else was hearing it talk back except for myself. I was the only one in the crew that could hear it, like speaking back to him. And I was like, this is crazy, you know? <laughs> like I really thought, I was like, this is crazy. And then he told me the next day, he said, well, the, he said, you know why you're the only one who heard it? I said, why? He said, well, you've got the gift. He said, but he said, you know, whether you want to pursue it or not, that's up to you. But he said, like, it's like a muscle. And, and he said, if you want to pursue this, I will help you. And if you don't, that's fine, too. You know, right. so uh, it, it was pretty, pretty cool and made the hairs on my arm <laughs> stand right at that point, because I always knew, like, I, I would get premonitions on things from time to time, but I didn't, never know what to make of it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and Peter kind of verified that for me. One of the things yeah. that Bill also uh, mentioned, um, and he and I pretty much came, uh, were coming from the same spot. Um, Siding said I was, I was picking up ghosts because of the, uh, um, you know, meter I was using. And no, I had nothing to do with that. I was, I was picking up electromagnetic fields and in areas where they're the highest is where you're going to have the experiences. And that's why he picked up the sewing room because he had a sewing machine. And of course, when that thing's on, you know, the, the fields jump, you know, astronomically. And um, so they, were, they would see things, you know, flashing lights and, and things, which could have that effect. The magnetic fields could have that effect and they could have a second effect on the human brain, you know, t today that electromagnetic fields can cause what we call psychic experiences or paranormal experiences to occur, um, even when nothing is happening. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's tr tricky, but we, at least we know that we've come that far, uh, that we know that. Um, but the, the other guy's name, uh, what was his name? Um, Paul Downs. He was the landlord, right? Paul Downs right. was the landlord. Right. And yeah. after the regression session, um, where apparently Beverly was was the girl who uh, was now haunting the place, who she had been dreaming about, and uh, Paul Downs was the soldier that they had seen. Um, and at at one point, uh, Peter 
mentions that the soldier uh, had been injured. He was in the Civil War. And he had a knee injury, and then Paul Downs immediately. I don't know if you remember. Was like I remember. He had a he had a knee injury from an athletic injury. You know the same yeah. knee. You know, and uh, and they again. You know, could they have been reincarnated? You know, or whatever. But that's again what the regression um, therapist was there for. And I think that she came up with some pretty substantial stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, and I from, and thanks for reminding me of that, Al. Um, yeah. yeah, and and I remember when we were trying to piece this whole thing together after the fact and figured, what do we got here? That was the, that was the narrative that all the producers, you know, and uh, back in L.A. that we we came to together was that. These guys might have been, might have known each other in past lives, and that they, and this was the running joke, was that they literally were haunting themselves. <laughs> yes, yeah, <that's laughs> and that took, and that took a while for me to wrap my brain around the concept of that's true. You know, can you haunt yourself? Mm -hmm. And I, I think I think it was possible, you know, because yeah. it was yeah. There were too many coincidences with the two of them. It was very odd. And um, Cause yeah. it was a really it was a good show to do. It was a nice show to do. Um, I wish I could have stayed there longer. I wish I could have been there when Peter was there, was there because we, again, we were had been friends um, uh, from other shows that we had done, um, specifically uh -huh. from uh, the Voices from Beyond when he, he came out and found found uh, some amazing things uh, mm -hmm. with that with that particular case. But um, I I think you know. People ask me, you know, do you believe that this is happening? Um, I can only put things into a perspective the way I see things in like a percentage, you know? Yeah, I'm probably 80% there, you know? Uh, I doubt if I'll ever be 100% there, but, you know, I'm, I'm about 80% there. That Yeah, this stuff was all, um, well, you can verify things, you know? You, right. you can go to a psychic and a psychic will give you information. And unless it can be verified, it's garbage. It's useless, really, unless you can verify it. Um, I've spent hours and hours in libraries and uh, looking through old deeds and old records and things just to verify information that's, that psychics have given me over the years. And I can tell you, I've, I've dealt with um, some very good ones, and I've dealt with some that give me nothing, you know, just, just nothing uh, checks out, you know, what they say. So but Peter James was a very good psychic, you know. Uh, his white hair and his... Black mustache, you know. <laughs> God bless him. You know, I I, I really enjoyed working with him. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> there you go. Here's a here's a question for both of you. Um, I get asked this question a lot, and I want to see what uh, you have for me. Uh, when on an investigation, do you ever worry about maybe something following you home? attaching to you and has that ever happened yeah, are you asking me or me well, I'll, start, I'll start with you al yeah uh no i don't have that i don't have that fear or apprehension or anything um you know i'm an old school uh investigator um okay. i've you know i've studied this i wrote my first paper before john kennedy was assassinated so that's how long i've been interested in this field um, I was in high school, and um, uh, I I pretty much um, go more with the scientific end of it mm -hmm. than with um, I don't know the ghost hunting end of it, if you want to call it that. Um, today, uh, every I, I don't watch the shows. I, I I haven't watched any of those shows unless I'm in somebody's house and it comes on and a show will come on, on because you know right. there's such garbage. But um, I. I, sometimes I, I just can't understand how people uh, could, um, you know, get into those mindsets. You know, you know what I'm trying to say, Dave. Um, yes. You yes. know, uh, everybody's being followed by something, and that's not to say I don't believe something could be attached to something, because I do believe you could bring something into the house that was attached to something you bought. You know, if it's if there's that that connection that, um, right. you know, to from the spirit and, and stuff. And I I've worked cases where supposedly 
it, you know, it pretty much happened that way because nothing was going on until they bought this thing and brought it in and suddenly everything's going on. So, you know, um, but I, I've never, I, I've never had any experience like that. And, uh, you know, uh, again, I know Mike, I don't know about, you know, you've done things too out there. Yeah, no, I, no, I've never had anything, anything like that either. But, and again, like I said, I, I haven't really been on location a ton, you know, I've, I've set up quite a few, but I've been on location a ton, so I've never heard of it. Anything yeah. like that. But I, well, yeah, I mean, well, I, I should say I haven't heard of it. I've heard of it, but I haven't experienced it personally. Right. Here's a, here's a photo I want to, uh, show you guys. I'm just curious if, uh, let's see. Al, have you ever worked with, uh, what did I do with it? Here we go. Sarah. Sarah, very, again, a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, um, he, uh, the last time I saw Sarah, um, she passed away a while ago. God bless her. Uh, you know what? As a matter of fact, real quick, uh, I was going through my files when I knew we were going to do this. I was going through my files just the other day and I'm pulling out letter after letter from Sarah Eastep, Bill Roll, you know, all these people, uh, Alex Tannis, you know, all these people who were really mm -hmm. big in the field. Um, Sarah was a sweetheart, a good friend of mine. Um, we agreed so much on EVP. Um, she had some theories that um, I, I, I don't question, but I don't, you know, really follow, but I don't question, um, in that she actually felt like some of the messages, the EVP messages, uh, and by the way, she's called the mother of EVP. Um, yeah. And uh, she, you know, she had messages, uh, she claims maybe from aliens even that have come through to her. But she's the one, uh, we talk at, I call her up, you know, nine at night, or she'd call me up at uh, nine o'clock at night, and we get off the phone at like 12, you know, just talking about uh, voices that we had gotten and cases that we were working on. And um, mm -hmm. uh, she's, a, she's a very, very dear friend. Uh, was a very, very dear friend. Her whole family, uh, her daughters too. Yeah, let's, uh, let's give a shout out to Becky. I've, uh, you know, spoke with her in the past. Um, Terrific person. Yeah, I, I liked uh, Sarah's work. I, I followed her. Follow, I'm sorry. Followed her also, yeah. Let me uh, let me see here. What was uh, what was it like to work with? Uh, if I can find him, <laughs> there we go. You asking me or you asking Mike? Oh, either one. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm drawing a blank on that. Who is that? <laughs> Kerry Gannon. Aha. Uh -huh. Gary Gaynor. Um, I, 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 I wasn't going to get into this, but I will get into it. Um, first, first show I did for sightings actually was done at my house. They came out and filmed me at my house. Um, it was a show that, uh, what would you do if you encountered a spirit? And they wanted to interview me. And then I took them out to a site, but, you know, a really perfect uh, type of a situation, an old house, you know, built in the 1800s. And, you know, we, uh, we worked on it so that, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned things that you should do. You know, we got the rocking chair going and we, you know, lights going on and all. You know, we got the whole thing going. Uh, that was the first show I ever did with them. The second show I ever did with them was um, The Heartland Ghost. And um, <laughs> The Heartland Ghost, um, I have not great memories about that show. Um, I flew out on a, I took two, two days off from work to do that show. And I flew out on a Thursday and uh, got there. Craig, and, Craig yeah, Armstrong? Yeah, Craig Armstrong, yeah. who was also a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. very good um, producer. And yeah, um, the crew we were supposed, when I got to the hotel, they were supposed to pick me up. We were supposed to go to the house and I was going to set up some equipment and um, you know, start, start a real investigation. And when I got to the hotel, I was told, oh, um, they don't want you to be, to be there tonight. They're not going let, to let, uh, let anybody in until tomorrow. And I'm like, well, that kind of kills me because 
you know, that really cuts my time with being there, trying to witness stuff. And when I did go there, the next day we didn't get there till noon or something. And I was leaving by four to go out and catch a flight, or maybe it was 11 or something in the morning. I was not allowed to tape record anything. I was not allowed to interview anybody. Um, although apparently afterwards, um, the woman who had lived there had written something nasty about me that, uh, that I interviewed her and I interviewed her husband. And I told her husband that she was causing the stuff. And I told her that her husband, which I wasn't allowed to interview anybody, <laughs> you know? So I don't know where that came from. Um, the fact that I was told I would be allowed to set up stuff, you know, uh, to do an investigation. And when I got there, I wasn't allowed to do any of that. So, yeah, I wasn't maybe in the best mood, but I, I was certainly sympathetic towards uh, what was going on. And, of course, that, that was the case with the bite marks and the scratches and the welts and the letters forming on the forehead. Uh, all happened in front of me. And certainly uh, I can attest to it. It did happen. He did not scratch himself. It did happen. Um, and um, I did have an opportunity to, yeah, that's the house. Okay, so I, I, have, I, got, I, got, I got to interrupt here. What did that feel like, Al? I'm so jealous hearing you just tell this. Because... Yeah, it was incredible. It was probably the most amazing thing I've ever seen uh, in that an must investigation. Have been unreal. Uh, I mean, so. we, we, would, we would actually dab the blood, you know, he would feel cold. Tony would feel cold, like his chest would feel cold. He'd open his shirt, and suddenly you see scratch marks. And their whole premise, because a psychic had been there at another time, and uh, said there was a little girl ghost in the house, which there probably was, um, was that she was scratching him and he was doing this. And you could see by the scratch marks, no, it's not a child's hand, okay? It's a, it's a bigger hand. It had nothing to do with a child. And that's what I said. That's what I told him. Um, they didn't want to hear that. Anyway, um, I, um, did, I did get a chance to interview Tony on the side. I wasn't on record it, but while, while Deborah was being interviewed, I snuck him into the kitchen and we talked and he poured his heart out and God bless him. I really, uh, feel, felt for him. Um, there was a lot yet of psychological things going on having to do with this intense pressure he was under. Now, people who are under intense pressure will often exhibit what we call poltergeist activity or RSPK, um, psychokinesis, recurrent psychokinesis. And that could be causing the stuff that was happening to him. And as I told her and as I told the sightings crew, um, when they asked my recommendation, I said I would set him up for uh, counseling. Um, what we know and uh, what we know in cases of poltergeist uh, cases, if you can get to the root of the problem, usually through hypnotherapy, but there's other regular therapy is also good. If you can get to the root of the problem and free it, it the activity is going to stop. I mean, Bill Roll did experiments with this, and it happened. It, that's exactly what would happen. He would start talking to the person, knowing what's going to trigger him, and stuff would start flying around. And as soon as they were able to uh, uh, calm him down and stop it, the activity would stop. And I mentioned that to the director, uh, and I don't remember who the director was that, that was with us that day. And I mentioned that to her, uh, to the wife. And I said, I believe this is what's happening. I set up a session at Benedictine College uh, for him to go to therapy free of charge. And um, the director said to me, I'll never forget it. The director said to me, we have 26 more shows to film. They didn't want it to stop. And she didn't want it to stop. And that's when I said, well, you'll do it without me. And I walked off the case. Um, I did get a voice there. Um, Deborah was talking and I got a clear voice, class A voice saying entirely, a woman's voice saying entirely, the word entirely, as if she was agreeing with what Deborah was saying. Uh, I wouldn't let him use it. And they got really upset about that. They offered to fly me out. They wanted to do an in-studio um, interview with me like they used to do, you know, uh, like it ended up right. with Kerry Gaynor, you know, which they, uh, you know, wanted to do, wanted me to do. And I said, no, unless, you know, you wanted me to come out and give you an evaluation. I did it under strict situation. I mean, I, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. And you'll notice in the following shows, everything I wanted to do, they were doing. They went in and did for Kerry, Gra Kerry Gaynor. 
but um, it was um, it, I just I just wouldn't didn't want to work with him in that situation. And the only thing I regret about that is that when I, if they had flown me out there, I would have got a chance to meet Henry Winkler like you guys did. And I never I never had that chance. I would mm -hmm. love to meet the Fonz, but uh, <laughs> you know I didn't have that opportunity. But um, and I stopped working with sightings for for uh, you know probably most of a year, uh, and then they called me back and they said we got rid of a lot most of those people. Um, can you would you come back and work with us again? And then I did. Then I did go back and I did a few more cases with them. Um, but right. uh, again, why somebody would say that I interviewed them when I didn't, you know? And then yeah. and then and then. Uh, and then I got a letter from her a couple of months after I'd been there from a lawyer representing her, asking me to sign this release that I wouldn't talk about the case. Or, and I immediately knew if there's a book coming out, there's, you know, uh, I, this is, so I, I wrote basically a letter back to her saying, I know what she was up to and I didn't sign anything. Um, yeah, I've been down that road before. And then, <laughs> again, I got some kind of a friend message from her on Facebook, like years later. You know, the person that she thought was, uh, you know, didn't help out at all, that she didn't agree with at all. Suddenly, you know, she wants to be my friend on Facebook. And it's like, come on. <laughs> but uh, but again, Kerry Gaynor went into the case after I stopped. I wouldn't go in anymore. And um, they were able to get a lot of stuff. Peter James, again, did that case, too. And he was able to pick up a lot of great stuff. He picked up Sally. You know, he immediately picked up Sally as soon as he got on site. And, and my aunt, my recommendation, I recommended some things about encouraging her and stuff. I said, I can't say there's no little girl ghost here. There probably is. But the girl, there's no girl ghost that's attacking him. Um, I knew there's plenty of information in the parapsychological literature about biting poltergeists, if anybody cared to read about them. And, uh, uh, and that's, what I, that's what I came up with. I actually talked with Bill Roll after that. He agreed 100% with me that that's what was causing it that's what was doing it and um but apparently and i understand their point i understand their point it was a great show to film they needed to keep you know stay out there as long as they could you know uh right you know it was incredible what was happening right in front of our eyes um well, and, and, and and to give you any any indication as to how much of a you know uh Goldmine Paramount thought that was they ended up buying that house. Oh, okay. Yeah. They bought the house yeah. and they, so they had some long-term plans for that place. Like there was discussions of maybe doing a feature film involving it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was, I, I don't know all the details cause it was, that all went down after, um, prior to me coming into the show, but, uh, yeah, only, you know, I'll tell you what, Production companies in Hollywood, they hate investing in stuff that they can't reuse, mm -hmm. you know. So there was no way they were going to buy that house unless they had bigger plans for it that were, you know, beyond sightings. Yeah. Two, so. two quick things about that case. Um, there was um, there was a, a um, I, when I spoke, I did speak to Tony. Um, I felt that there was another entity on on site, I thought think there was a woman there. Um, this never came out in sightings. Um, he confided in me, and I never really told anybody. I'll, I'll say part of what he confided in me, but um, he said that there was a woman um, who had been appearing to him, and her name was Olivia. And I won't get into it anymore, but um, at one spot, he saw on in the show. Uh, I looked at, at Tony and letters started forming on his forehead. And I called Tim White over and I said, Tim, take a look at this. And we watched as letters formed on his forehead. The letters that came that formed were I A V I L O, which backwards is Olivia spelled incorrectly because the I and, and the A were in, incorrectly spelled. But it, you know, it was Olivia and it was spelled on his forehead. And um, it was as if you, if he would have looked in the mirror, he would have saw it, you know, per, you know, with the I and the A misspelled. But uh, which told me again that 
he was mentally causing this. Um, I didn't follow the case anymore. A friend of mine, a couple friends of mine followed it or were following it. Um, I, I didn't follow it anymore. I didn't want to have anything to do with it, with it anymore um, because of what appeared to me at the time was a heartless reaction uh, to what was going on there. I wanted to help this guy out. But um, I also couldn't see. I mean, they were a television show, you know, they were a television show and a damn good television show as, as opposed to the stuff that, you know, came out later, you know, or that's, yeah. that's out there today. That was a, a mm -hmm. damn good television show. Yeah. And, 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 but even that show, you know, as you, you know, as you've just described, um, sometimes they will, uh, you know, uh, manipulate things or massage a certain stuff story to uh to end up with the outcome that makes for a nice nice hollywood ending <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but but sightings but sightings did not do that very much i i then worked on you know a few other shows where that nonsense went on a lot more which would be a nice segue oh, yeah. into scariest places on earth yep yep <laughs> i remember who to call you made to me and I, I apologize but i remember the call you made to me uh to do a show there with it and i really didn't want to do it and you understood yeah. it, you know which I yeah yeah no I, I i i totally did i totally did because you know uh we really did our best at sightings i i used to tell people it was i i felt it was like the 60 minutes of paranormal you know where yes it was entertainment but there also was some good instructional educational stuff in there yeah. where the stuff you see today is really, to be honest, all sizzle and not a whole lot of steak. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know what? And no controls, no controls at all. Um, right. Yeah. It, you know, right. It, it, it's so funny, you know, they're getting stuff on, on their recorders. You know, meanwhile, there's, you know, six people in the room next to them, you know, and one of them farted, you know, or something. But, but they're getting, you know, they're getting stuff. Oh, man, <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous, yeah. you know, what they're, yeah. the way they're doing. Yeah. Um, there was some, some interesting stuff, though, that um, Tony showed me at the time, too, uh, in the house. Uh, like there was a, a, a note written in crayon, like a child's handwriting um, yeah. that they suddenly found, you know, uh, one day, I don't know. Um, I think, I think this, it was also a case, I believe this was, I'm not hundred percent sure because I, I had so many and I mix up some, um, you know, but I think this might've been also a ca the case where Tony was lying on the couch and the remote from the television came through the ceiling and hit him on the, on the back, on the bare back. Um, and when he picked it up, it was, it was warm to the touch. I couldn't find a remote to the, and nobody was in the house. And suddenly it like came right from the ceiling, you know, through the ceiling, which, which, which is called in a port. Uh, and again, it's also typical of a poltergeist type of a situation. Right. Um, you know, there's, there was so much, uh, again, this, I don't think this was brought out in sightings either, but this thing followed him to work. Well, if it's following you to work, it's poltergeist. You know, you're causing the, the activity. And uh, a door ripped off the hinges, if I remember, in, in his office, you know. Um, so, you know, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to accept my evaluation of the case, which is fine. You know. Yeah, I believe you. You know, that's... Uh... <laughs> That's exactly why I never did any TV shows that I was offered. You know, I, yeah. I just turned them down because if it couldn't be done right, I didn't. I wasn't interested. I didn't want to do it. The uh, yeah. show, the original show, Ghost Hunters, um, called me and asked me if I would be their um, investigator, uh, myself and my partner. And I questioned the production company. And I questioned them. Is right at the beginning, two thousand and what? Was it five or something when I started or something? I don't know. And I said, uh, sure. how many times when you go out on cases, you're there all night and nothing happens. What are you going to do when, when that, you know, when you film a show like that? And their answer was, well, we're going to have, we have an audience, so we may have to fabricate some stuff. And I said, well, then you can do it with somebody else because you're not going to do it with me. 
And uh, you know, I walked away from that too. Yeah. And he found two guys that would do it. And you go go on the internet and you find all kinds yeah. of fake stuff that they did that they agreed to. You know, but whatever. You know, I, I my reputation is too important. I used to do <clears throat> a lot of uh, Eastern State Penitentiary uh, yeah. investigations overnight. <laughs> and, and I remember when Taps went there and they had, um, well, they claimed they captured a spirit running down one of the, uh, what do they call them, catwalks. Yes. Yep. All this thing was hooded but had tenor shoes on. Yes. Yep. I know. <laughs> so. And how about how about the uh, how about the one where he was getting his uh, shirt pulled, and it turns out yeah, he had a string down right. his pocket. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, they're the kind of people you want investing. But you know what? They got they sell a lot of shows. You know, they they yeah, a lot of people watch yeah. it. Yeah, sightings was you know not like that. Exactly, uh, sightings was my favorite. Yeah, all time favorite. Look, I found something online. I said. I told my wife, I'm going to go online and I'm going to look and see if there's any memorabilia. Uh, I found this online. And how much do you think they're asking for it? For, for I, uh, I, I, look, I, looked, I looked away, Dave. What did you just flash? Let, let me put it back up there for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, go ahead. $150. <laughs> oh yeah! Wow. Oh my god! I'm like, well, I guess I won't be wearing that shirt or, or buying that <laughs> shirt, you know. So I got, I got news for you. I got like five Cosby jackets that I can't give away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I should have. I should. Whoever's selling those on eBay, I should have them wrap my stuff. My, yeah, Cosby. My, uh, my collection. <laughs> he lives here in my hometown. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here yeah. in PA. Oh. Yeah. I see That's another podcast. I see my, my friend Doug, Doug Hornick has been putting comments in. Doug's a really good guy, good friend, and an old uh, fan of my old podcast, I think, yeah. Right. Doug Hornick, I see you. Uh... Hi, Doug. Doug and Judy. Uh, yeah. Boy, sightings, you... me sightings memorabilia. I think – I'm trying to I think because, th you know, I – and uh, uh -huh. Al, you may – Al, you may not have never never known this, but the way I came about sightings was my wife worked there first, oh. uh, doing research, and then she was the yeah. clearance coordinator. Um, Christy Dixon, she okay. worked with Greg Fine. You probably dealt with Greg also. Yeah, for I remember like Greg. release for like legal releases and that sort of stuff. Yeah, when I had yeah. a car accident at uh, when I had a quick car accident in Natchez, Kansas. At the, that's another thing for the Heartland Ghost, like a thing, a car accident with the rental car, which they took care of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I started on the show completely like huge skeptic. You know, I, was, I, I got on that show because my wife had worked there initially and I came in as a skeptic and I left a believer where mm -hmm. most people, it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, the, the plenty was a good case to to have belief in, I mean, oh, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, that was that was it for me. I saw enough stuff go down there that I, I left there a changed person, <laughs> you know. It was, um, I so that's it was, pretty much what uh, gave you the inspiration to uh, uh, pursue uh, paranormal investigations, so to say. Yeah, well, for me, it, just because it – because I also was a writer, um, and I and I did have this weird, you know, ability to kind of sniff bullshit over the phone. But right. a lot of people also told me it's because I was raised in Brooklyn, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, that that also, you know, uh, New Yorkers can usually smell bullshit a mile away, as can Jersey guys, right, Al? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's why they don't like us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. totally. What we're smelling over here is burnt Canada. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, with the, oh, fire, man, orange yeah. outside. Really? Yeah. Let me show you this, and then I'm going to, uh, and then we'll discuss something uh, that relates to this. Here's something I found I just recently purchased. Didn't know it was out there, but uh, you know what that is? A 
I'll show you yeah. some more. Oh, that's the Amityville house. Amity, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can tell the, that's colonial. Yeah. The shit. Yeah, the, 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 story. the sh I was gonna say <laughs> some cute little house on Cape Cod <laughs> with, <laughs> with the shingles <laughs> and everything, but you know, close yeah. Amityville. Amityville. Okay, yeah. so related to that, uh, the Warrens. Uh, I think both of you uh, had the opportunity to work with them. Yeah, and I, I, I'll just tell real quickly. I don't have great memories mm -hmm. of conversations, and it's mostly because of uh, I've had I've had some some health issues over the years, and it's kind of whacked my memory quite a bit. But I will tell you this: when I initially was given their their name and number to call because at one point they were they were consultants for the show similar to al and they said well why don't you call call you know they said call the warrens and i was like what warrens and they said well you know ed lorraine i was like seriously those warrens and they're like yeah go ahead call them we'll 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 you know and if they if they if they if they if they you know they're charge a fee that's fine so I was like thrilled because, and, and I got to tell you, I was super intimidated the first time I called them and they could not have been nicer. They had this like energy that would like sweet old grandparents, you know, um, that's the way they treated me. They were very sweet and always, you know, looking out for, uh, you know, for us and, uh, you know, what was always important to to me, I got from them was like the welfare of the crew and the safety uh -huh. of the crew, because obviously they knew the really dark side of how some of these things could go. And I think Ed was the one who explained to me the difference between um, a, what, what you perceive to be a shadow and a moving shadow. And he was like, if it's a shadow, don't worry about it. If it's a moving shadow, Get the hell out of there. <laughs> like he, he in no certain uncertain terms said, if you go in there and you see moving shadows, he said, don't mess around with that crap, Mike. He said, just just leave. You know, you're in over your head. Uh, because he knew I, I wasn't necessarily very well read and up to speed on, on, the, on, on a lot of the stuff. But um, that's all I have to say about working with the Warrens is, you know, a couple of times I, when I spoke to him on the phone, I would always ask him questions about, all right, does this sound legit to you? How do you think we should approach this? Yada, yada, yada. And they were always very sweet and lovely. Al, what are your, what are your memories? Because, and I'll tell you, Al, you got not, a way better memory than me. Man, I'm, I'm envious. <laughs> I'm envious of the details that you're remembering yeah. in these things. Yeah, I can, uh, I can tell you what happened with the Warrens and myself. Well, they were, back in like the 60s, they were ghost hunters, basically. Um, they switched over to uh, demonologist after The Exorcist, the movie The Exorcist, and they saw how much money was in that field. Um, I can tell you two quick stories about the Warrens. I was on a panel. Um, Matt Lara was actually the host, and um, the Warrens were on the show. When I was uh, coming on the show, they wanted to talk about uh, demonic possession and uh, things like that it was on the show. So I asked a um, Catholic priest, that I know who's a, uh, a psychologist and a parapsychologist. Uh, I asked him to come on the show with me and the producer agreed to it. Everybody agreed to it. Uh, and uh, the, it was a Monday morning show. Sunday night, I called the uh, this priest up and I said, you ready for tomorrow? And he says, oh, didn't you, didn't you know? They, told, they called me and told me not to be on the show. I says, well, what do you mean they told you not to be on the show? He says, yeah, they said the Warrens said that they won't be on the show if you come on the show. Wow. So that tells me a lot about the Warrens right there. Um, the second thing I remember about the Warrens was um, during the Amityville Horror, uh, when it was a big, a big thing, and they were very much involved in it, if you remember. Um, mm -hmm. The Psycho Research Foundation, which I was a, a part of, and the American Society of Psycho Research, which I was also a part of, uh, sent representatives to the house uh, with Alex Tanis, who at the time, uh, Michael, you might know Alex Tanis because because New York he was uh, the psychic for the American Society for Psych Research probably the greatest psychic at the time uh, he's also yeah, passed on yeah. uh, everybody <clears throat> I know is passed on I don't know and uh, uh, <laughs> he, 
the um, they went into the house and they went through the entire house. And as they were leaving the house, the Warrens burst through the door with a television crew and they were going here, there and everywhere. And when they got back to the car, they said, Alex, what did you, you know, what did you see in the house? And he said, the only thing I saw was a signed book contract. And that again, you know, says a lot about, uh, about them, but um, you know, they have their following, obviously there's, they're out there now, apparently, I don't know, there's nephew or somebody else. I don't know what, you know, uh, following up with that. Um, right. Uh, before we did the uh, the panel show, and I said, well, then I'm not going to go on the show too. And, and the priest said, you have to. You're going to be the only one speaking sense, you know, on the show. You can't just let them be on the show. Uh, so, um, but before that, I actually had, um, I, I polled a number of investigators and parapsychologists that I was friends with, uh, probably about six of them, probably with, you know, three or 400 years of experience. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, three or 400 cases or, or years of experience and none of them had ever got you know ever experienced anything like that that what the warrants are finding every place um mm -hmm. then i also contacted uh, religious members that i knew uh, even if i didn't know them i called them you know the local lutheran minister the uh local catholic priest the or not even i even went to colleges um, and some priests that i knew in uh or, or teachers and none of them had ever been involved with such with a case like that and the ones i found out that i spoke to from universities um basically and i tried to get someone with a psych psychology background um basically said there's other other things going on right. uh, so you know that's my story i'm sticking to it <laughs> i'm sticking to it yeah it, it seems crazy to me though that that they wouldn't, you know, accept your work is 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 valid. What what do you think their problem was or hang up was? Um, you're talking about um, the Pikmins and uh, and sightings. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, because okay. it, it sounded it sounded like the Warrens oh, took issue they, with you. They're, um, they're and, and, and 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 EVP. Right? Yeah, when I when I called them, I I wasn't really big in EVP at that point. But um, their answer to me when I, when I basically called them fanatics uh, on the show, uh, their answer to me was um, the reason that you don't see this as much as we do is because you don't do it full time. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's a good reason. I don't know. And I do it full time. They do it full time. Um, they've no. been sued so many times. Uh, if you look, they've been sued a number of times. Um, yeah. Knock on wood, I haven't been sued yet. But okay. now, so now I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. Don't mean to take over the show, but I'm curious. Al, has the has the equipment changed for what you do over the years? Because you know, I, I got to tell you, when I when when we first did uh, the thing with Plenty, I thought you were going to have big, elaborate, you know, equipment and whatnot. And and is it still pretty much that straightforward? Where it's just a no, kind of a you know. It's not a change over the years, but uh, I mean, back then when we did uh, plenty, I was using like an analog tape recorder. I mean, digital tape recorders hadn't come out yet, right. you know. Uh, you know, right, um, right. You know, then once I went to a digital tape recorder, it was so much easier to use. Um, picked up oh, yeah. you know, easier for vo pick up voices. You didn't have that um, ambient noise like you have with the analog tapes, and uh, so much easier to put on a computer and use, um, mm -hmm. you know, audio. Uh, software, uh, and you know, it's it's uh, it's it's so much better today. It's so much better. I mean, play, yeah. I would take I could take things like um, tapes that I made, you know, years ago, and I could go over that tape twenty times and not hear anything. Um, if I use uh, use a digital tape recorder, I'd probably find five voices, you know, on there because you can work with it so much easier. Um, so they, one of the things that, uh, like I said, I'm an, I'm a old school investigator. I think you can learn a lot interviewing people. You know, I think you can learn a lot, um, going, uh, going around, around the house, uh, and, um, with a meter to see where le magnetic fields are the highest. I mean, there's still people out there that say, oh, you're, you're, um, you're recording a ghost with your meter. 
You know, you're not recording a ghost with your meter. You're recording a magnetic field. Um, these things need energy. They need energy to manifest. There's two sources of energy, electrical sources and us. They'll, use, they'll draw energy from us or they'll use the electrical energy that's available. There's your magnetic field. There's your ele electromagnetic field. Uh, people are always, and it happened in, uh, you know, in Heartland goes to, oh, I'm feeling cold here. I'm feeling cold spots here. Well, I had equipment at, at the scene and I wasn't reading any temperature drops in the exact spots that they were having cold. Right. You know? So how, how are they feeling cold? Well, these things draw energy from us. And when you lose energy, what happens? You feel cold. And I believe that's, you know, that's why so many people. Now, at certain times, you can register temperature drops. I've done that. I've registered them. I registered one. I remember at the exact moment I got a voice on tape. And it's right at the, right at the tape recorder. I measured a, a, te a temperature drop of almost 10 degrees. You know? And, uh, but usually when I go out for the first time on a, on a case, I don't bring a bunch of stuff. I just interview and uh, I'll do EVP uh, sessions. You know, the next time um, we would go out, uh, we would have cameras, you know, set up. I'd have uh, monitors showing four shots of different areas. Um, you know, we, we, we had a lot more, a lot different equipment. Sometimes we'd have thermal uh, cameras. Uh, most of, but most of the time, I, you know, that stuff's expensive. The, uh, the show would, would, you know, give me that stuff to use. Um, I just uh, went on my own investigations. I would have to put out money for stuff. But, um, you know, when I did, uh, for example, one of the shows I did with Sightings, um, which is from Beyond, they brought this really extensive um, tape recorder in to use uh, that, uh, I forget what type it's it was. Probably like a NACRA. NACRA yeah, a NACRA, NACRA, like that, NACRA, right? yeah, 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 you know, and, uh, yeah. and we, you know, did some sessions with that. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, most of the time uh, when I go out uh, when, with other shows I've got on, too, they'll, they'll give, give me thermal cameras to use. You know, um, we'll usually set up a, a, a room where we can monitor everything, you know, and have um, temperature sensors, and which I have myself, uh, my own temperature sensors in different areas of rooms where things have happened. And I, I have them so that I can actually take readings, you know, every five or 10 minutes and, you know, and see, you know, where temperature drops are in which rooms and which locations. But um, today, uh, I mean, they go out with all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff out there for ghost hunters. Um, oh, know, my goodness. Al, let me tell you, I'm, I'm old school like you. There's a lot of stuff today that I would not use. I would not touch. Right. Uh, I'll mention a couple uh, the Ovilus, the, uh, the ghost box. Yeah. And there's a lot more than that, but, uh, I'm old school, you know, and, and my main uh, thing to do that I enjoyed was EVP work. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a team and I would leave the video part to them and, you know, the editing and stuff like that. And sound was my specialty. That's that's what I enjoyed working with. Yeah, exactly. Um, by the way, that, uh, that voice that I got at... Um, um, the Pikmin house. Uh, I brought it back. I was working for an air conditioning company then, and uh, we had a lab downstairs, and it was basically a sound lab, but it uh, wasn't like real, a uh, real extensive. But it would measure frequencies. Uh, it would measure sound frequencies. And when I got that voice, there was three people talking in that conversation, and we were able to isolate each voice, uh, uh, a certain sound of each voice, and then the fourth voice, and Every sound came out at a different frequency, so we knew that that fourth voice wasn't anybody speaking that was there at the time. It was an EVP voice that had its own unique frequency that it, that it popped out at. Um, I remember we did that uh, in the sound lab that I had, that we had. Um, so that, you know, that's, again, that's something, something that um, kind of verifies, you know, what you're doing. I, I'll stay away from these voice boxes and stuff. You, you're running through frequency. It's a constant running through frequency, exactly. you know? Yeah. Well, how do you know what you're getting? What voices, you, whose voices you're getting on that? Um, you know, in the old days, they would uh, use the old um, uh, radios, you know, the old, what do you call them, the cats, uh, 
four, or whatever they used to call it, their old for mm-hmm. little scanners. radio you know, scanners, and they would, you know, they pick up voices. You know, well, you know, great, but ham radios control, and stuff like control. that. Yeah. You know, you Air don't cats. have the control. Yeah. You don't have the controls. Um, when I'm doing a session, if somebody moves, if their stomach makes a noise, I say stomach. You know, if uh, a car yeah. goes by outside, I say car. You know, I don't want. I don't want to go back on that thing tomorrow and say, oh wow, I think I hear a voice. You know. And it's not mm-hmm. it's somebody's stomach. It's somebody shifting their weight and their floor is creaking. Right. Um, you always have to mention that. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, and, and, you know, when you're still getting the voices and, you, and you're getting, I've had my name called a number of times, <laughs> not on my own recordings. Right. Uh, there was a woman who I was working with, Bill Roll uh, put me in touch with her out in San Francisco, who um, was... She was she was in, wasn't into EVP. She was just like in, being introduced to it. So I gave her some tips on how to do stuff, and um, and how to get voices. And uh, at let's see, she told she contacted me at six. It was six thirty her time in San Francisco. So it was like nine thirty my time in New Jersey. And she called me, and she said. Um, I said, oh, you know, I, that's weird. I was just thinking about you. I said, I was just thinking about you like 10 minutes ago that, you know, I haven't heard from you in a long time. She said, 10 minutes ago, like 6.30? I said, yeah. She says, I was taping this morning, and I got your name on my tape recorder four times at 6.30, 9.30, you know? Wow. I mean, the same time, you know, or, or around the same time, you know, she got my name. Um, weird. But yeah. I guess I'm known. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know what uh, what's funny is when you look up the definition for EVP, uh, it, you know, in like Google and stuff like that, it says scientists believe that people are picking up transmissions from like. Uh, airplane radios and and uh what was the other one uh oh that the person using the recorder somehow is printing a voice from them as the answer um i wrote a i wrote a a short article about that uh, well that short i guess one time and that's what i proposed i proposed um, possibilities, you know, um, we know that it's not radio waves, you know, it's, it's not, at least on a recorder, uh, we know that because they're calling your name, they're mentioning things that only, that are, only you can identify with or know, right. uh, they're talking about incidents in your life, you know, they're talking about incidents that are going on right at that, at that minute, um, we were doing a house in, in Cape May, and, uh, the the, uh, the the show's producer um, said, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a little a little frightened by this. He said, I'm a little uneasy in this room. And a voice comes on and says, you're a joke. <laughs> Just like that, you know, you're a joke. <laughs> you know? And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, we'll ask a question. Um, were you, are you, are, were you living in the 1800s or the, uh, 1900s and we'll get a voice clear as day 1800s you know they're answering your question um right. do we have any of our unseen friends here today we're here you know you're getting answers um to your questions that's not a random radio signal uh right you know uh but i do believe now psychologists will tell you that the human mind the human personality is not one personality Everybody, every human being has multiple personalities with one dominant personality. Now, at certain times, and this dominant personality is keeping the other personalities in line, basically. Um, at certain times, could one of those other personalities, sub-personalities, be coming through and imprinting, 3PK, imprinting stuff on the tape? You know, it's certainly, to me, it. If they can move things, why can't they imprint messages on tape? You know, um, excuse me. That's what that's what you know. That's what um, 
I, I proposed at one time in an article I wrote. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But uh, when when they start coming through regularly, then what do you have? You have multiple personality syndrome, you know, and you've got a real case on your hands. But uh, but that's you know, there's a trap door that you know that's in your brain that keeps these other personalities in line. But apparently. Um, and again, people will ask me too, another, and probably you, Dave, probably you have the same question. Why do these things always happen at night? Well, they don't always happen at night. They happen during the day, but right. they're not here during the day, first of all. Second of all, at night, what happens at night when you're going to sleep? All your, all your physical senses are shutting down so that you can sleep. That allows a sixth sense that most psychologists, 90% of psychologists say we have more than you know, five senses. That sixth sense to suddenly come through, and they're able to sense, you know, to um, sense things, you know, at night. Um, you have more aware in that way. But that's again, just like when people investigate. Why does the light have to be off? Why yeah. does it, Why does yeah. it have to be dark? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Why do you have you to know, go? <laughs> You're right. I've had plenty of things happen during the daytime. Yes. And in the daytime when not expecting it because you're not, you know, you're taking a break from it. You're not doing anything and it just happens. So yeah. it has nothing to do with nighttime or being in the dark. And, you know, I try to tell people that all the time. They're like, no, nah, I think it sets the mood. I'm like, okay, your mood. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's good for TV too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was yeah. going to say, yeah, but, uh, definitely yeah. good for TV when you when you do these things at night versus during the day, right? Yeah. Al, let me ask you about this. I just noticed this uh, yesterday. Uh, let's see. Oh, Lex's uh, book. Yeah, is is that still available? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, I'm sure both of them are. He has two of them. Yeah, I usually uh, Lex is, is uh, it's an old friend. He's a um, uh, lives out in the West Coast. Uh, actually, he he did the music for our podcast years ago, and it was the most phenomenal thing. Um, right. And um, I, a lot of times, you know, I'll, he'll ask me for advice on different things, and I'll try to help him. He's just a good guy. Okay. So yeah, in that case, uh, I, yeah. I'm interested. Uh, like to get a copy of it. I uh, have a good, pretty good library of uh, you know books and stuff like that. Um, well, he may he may uh, he may be listening to this. So if not, I'll I'll let him know. Okay. Thank okay. you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, let me take a look over here. Hey, look, I'm going to do something real quick. I hate to do this, but I have to. Um, I'm sorry. Um, you guys can keep talking. I'm going to return in like about two minutes. I have to take care of what I got to do. All right. So I'm going to mute. All right. He's muted, right. but Al, you and I can free to chat. Yeah, I guess so. I, for some reason, I, I have my tablet here and I've got it plugged in, yet it looks like the battery keeps going down. So I don't know what the heck. Maybe the plug's not in right. Let me check that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's better. <laughs> uh -huh. um, did you ever hear about any... So, I'm in Spokane, Washington now. And there was a woman's mental institution, literally like, I would say about 10 minutes from here. And it's right across the street from a place I... I used to go fishing when I first moved here years ago, and it was Eastern. It was a, I think it was Eastern State Hospital, but it was for like, it was specifically for women, and it was for you know it was a psych it was a psych hospital which was closed years and years ago. Um, did you ever hear any stories about that? It's I, in I, I, or Washington. There, it's in Washington State. It's right yeah. outside of Spokane. Technically, it's in an area called Medical Lake, mm -hmm. but not. I not didn't, too but far. a lot of the psychiatric uh, 
hospitals, you know, they're they apparently, uh, you know, have had activity in uh, other cases. There's one in Jersey too, uh, apparently that that had a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, I, you know, I would think hospitals. Well, and stuff. Hey, you know what I was going to tell you? Yeah. Um, and Dave, one thing that uh, remember when sightings came out, then all these other shows came out, Encounters, the, uh, the Other Side, um, uh, Paranormal Borderline. Remember they all came out after they saw how successful right. sightings was, remember? Yeah. And I, I actually worked with almost all of them, but uh, well, pretty much all of them. But um, sightings, I always went to them with a, 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 uh, proposed uh, an idea um, to get onto Ellis Island. I had I gotten reports on Ellis Island a number of times, and no matter who I went to, I went to them, and then they, they couldn't get it on. I went to the other, none of them could get on there. The government would, would not let anybody, uh, you know, film something like this on there. Yet there's, I think, a lot of stuff going on on Ellis Island. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a, a place that I did from 2007 to 2016. It was called the Ramblewood Mansion. It was built in 1865, uh, had something to do with the uh, Underground Railroad. And I'll tell you what, I wished, uh, <laughs> you know, I wished sightings would have been around when, you know, I had full access to that because I'd have brought you guys in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I have some friends that are in the chat room tonight, and I'll tell you, they would uh, definitely... Uh, agree with me. So, uh, in the future, I'm going to be doing a show about the Ramblewood Mansion, and uh, and no, that'd uh, be cool. Just, that'd be cool to watch. Yeah. yeah, I got a lot of stuff to dig out, and uh, you know, to get it ready. And uh, then when I'm ready, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make it into a show one night. Hey, Dave, do you ever get down to uh, Ocean City, New Jersey? Uh, no. Yeah. No. There's, I, the reason I'm asking, there's a bench there. So that was Sarah Eastep's favorite place, by the way. And they've got a memorial bench on the boardwalk for Sarah. If you're ever down no. there, you, can, you know, take a look oh, for it. That's, wow. that's cool. Yeah. I, uh, I used to be, my family uh, used to vacation down there quite a yeah. bit as a okay. kid when I was, uh, yeah. We would start off at Staten Island. We used to go down there. All the mm -hmm. time, my my grandma lived down in uh, D.C. and I think that was like the happy the happy middle area. Yeah. Uh, great memories, man. Back oh, when, good place. yeah, yeah. My grandkids uh, love it. Yeah, I have lots of memories of getting solar cane shock. <laughs> 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 you know, pre. Uh, Pre, pre any kind of like SPF anything. It was like right, solar came right. here, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, man. Good old days. See here. Let me take a look. Uh, uh, Al, can you see the comments? Doug Hornick sends his best there. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did see, I did see that. Too, um, yeah. That's why right. I give a shout out to Doug and Judy. Good people, really good people. Yeah. But yeah, the uh, so the the software. So my my wife does voiceovers for a living, Al. And at one point we had like a I kid you not a two ton voice isolation booth in my house, my old house. Now I've got a much much lighter one, but she still does that on the side. But by default, I've uh, you know, and I was a video I was video editor before I left Hollywood in the uh, right around '07, and um, I uh, never did much with audio. But once she started doing books on tapes and that sort of thing, I started uh, by default. I became her editor. And I started learning some of these programs. And dude, I mean, that's what your head must spin. I don't know if you've ever looked in like some of the things that like Adobe Audition and yeah. RX Isotope and 
some of these pro so the things that these programs can do now without completely destroying audio is unbelievable. I use unbelievable. Addition. I use addition on EVPs. Your addition? Um, yeah, I'm not yeah. That good at it, but I, I've always used it for years now. Yeah. I remember we we she had a recording where there literally was a jackhammer in the background, and someone said, "Oh, just download Audition and learn learn how to use the spectrograph." Mm -hmm. And you, you could remove. I was able to remove that without <laughs> with without damaging like the uh, you know the overall quality of the of the sound. Mm -hmm. Which in the past, like in a before digital in an analog, once you start monkeying around with equalizers and you know that you really mess with the yep. the overall mm -hmm. quality and tone of the of the you know of the sounds and the voices I've got man, a lot this of was like non non-destructive unbelievable i've got a whole lot of so, equipment that i do nothing with it <laughs> it's sitting in, you know can't use it anymore you paid money a lot of money for it and it's just sitting there yep. yeah yeah i know well it's like photoshop most people know how to do like most people use maybe 5% of what Photoshop can do, right? Mm. I mean, it's it's incredible what software can do these days. Yeah, Technology, yeah it is. Man. It's very incredible. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so um, because I have diabetes, I used to be a lot sharper when I uh, would mess around with uh, software and stuff like that. And... <clears throat> There's a few programs that I stopped using for a while uh, because I had gotten sick. And uh, now I'm trying to redo it all over again. I'm like learning it all over again. And it, it, it's been rough, you know. <clears throat> you know, when you have diabetes, it just beats the hell out of you. And, 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 and before you know it, there's something else wrong. And. You know, I just uh, get to the point where I get depressed from it. But uh, I'll be seeing a kidney doctor in a couple of weeks for an echo. Uh, they're now saying that my uh, kidneys are uh, not functioning like they used to. But I've been a diabetic since 2001. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to share it with you real, real short. Um I had went and got a blood, blood test on back in 2001 because I was uh, getting some insurance on me and it was required. So my test came back that I was good. I was good. Nothing wrong with me. One week later, I hit with my patrol car. I hit a tractor trailer head on. And what happened was I passed out behind the wheel and I hit this tractor trailer at 80 miles an hour. Um, you know, because my foot just punched down on the gas and I was laying on the steering wheel. And uh, so after waking up in the hospital, the doctor says, you know, your sugar is like 800 or something. I'm like, what? He says, did you know you were diabetic? I said, no, a week ago I wasn't. <laughs> there you go. Wow. So, Good luck, man. Good luck with that. Thank you. Yeah. So it's it's rough. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mad at myself because I, uh, I used to be able to, I used to be able to do a lot of things with software and, you know, when, when I stopped using it, now I'm finding out that, man, I got to do this all over again. I got to learn all over again. So it is what it is. And yeah. Well, you're never um, too, never, never too old to learn a new trick. Don't, don't give up hope. Okay, here's a, here's a question, uh, I guess, for Al or, or Mike. Hygrometers? Do you use hygrometers? Hygrometers. <laughs> Go ahead, Al. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> I don't use them. You don't use it? Okay. No. Okay. And what is it? I, I, I don't know what it is. Never, never saw it. Yeah, I can't. Be think for Google. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's a yeah. hygrometer. <laughs> hygrometer. Yeah. What is a hygrometer? I don't even know what that is. Hygrometer. 
an instrument for measuring the humidity of the air or a gas. Ah, okay. So just to basically check for humidity. Yeah. yeah. Those pictures you were I throwing think... up earlier, Dave, those weren't, did, did you just find those online or did you take those out? Uh, the photos that I put yeah. up, which ones were you referring to? Uh, well, like the ones of uh, Peter. Uh, I got them online, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Let me throw this back up there again. I miss TV shows. When you take I was actually asked to do a, to be, I mean, many years ago, I was actually asked to be a keynote speaker at, um, at one of the, one of the big um, ghost conferences in Gettysburg, but I didn't, uh, I didn't accept it. I didn't yeah, it. I, I used to do the uh, paranormal conferences every year. That's where I met Tony and uh, Deborah. Uh, that oh, was okay. in Gettysburg at Phenomenology. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually used to be uh, their sound guy for, you know, the guest speakers and oh, okay. I would set up uh, the microphone system and PA system and stuff like that. And then later on out in the bar, we would do karaoke, which <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> Boy, was it scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, got the I got the stupidest EVP I ever got, not because of... The answer because of me <laughs> at Gettysburg. <laughs> when I, I was out on the field one night, and uh, and uh, I, you know, talking to the, to the tape recorder, and I said, um, "How did you die?" And the answer comes back, "Shot." No oh, shit. <laughs> of course you were shot. <laughs> what a stupid That's question to ask. Like... What a stupid <laughs> question to ask, right? <laughs> yeah, I was with a with a friend, and we were at uh, Fort Howard uh, State Hospital, which was uh, a veteran hospital, old veteran hospital, closed down. And we happened to be in the morgue, and my friend and I were doing an EVP session. And my friend says, uh, "Why don't you jump out of the freezer and smack me if you can, right?" And later on, when I reviewed my digital recorder, it says. Ha ha, you're so funny. <laughs> yeah, see, see, I mean, you know, that's that's what I mean. You know, I've got some one thing about that um that uh Pigment House. Uh one thing I did that the you know, the uh director and uh, they all went nuts, you know, when I did this. I said, mm -hmm. Okay, I rolled up my sleeves and uh, the cameras came right on my arm and said, Okay, if you're uh so upset, do it to me. I sat there, you know, with my arms extended and sleeves rolled up. I opened up my shirt. I said, scratch me if you're, if, you know, um, if you're that upset. And um, like five minutes later, nothing happened, of course, you know, and, uh, but that would have been cool. You know, if something happened, you know, to me, that would have been really cool, you know, but um, of course nothing happened. Um, I wasn't punishing myself, but I believe, I still believe that Tony was hurting himself, probably punishing himself for some for the fact that he couldn't protect his family, and it was just so such an overwhelming, um, you know, uh, thing that was on his constantly on his mind. He told me, he says, uh, you know, she started a teddy bear on fire. She started this flower on fire. She could start me on fire, you know. She, what, how can I not? How can I stop? You know, again, thinking that this little girl ghost was doing it. You know, and I don't, I still to today don't think so. I think he was a fighting poltergeist. It was, he, he was, he was doing it to himself, not consciously, subconsciously. He was causing this stuff to happen. I mean, when you, when you measure those uh, scratch marks, that's not a child's hand. Now, when you picked up the uh, teddy bear in yeah. that episode, and I think you directed your attention to, I think it was Tim White. There was something mentioned about a chemical. I asked, yeah, that's what I asked. I said, was there a chemical? Do you know if there okay. was a chemical put on this? It looked like a burn, but a chemical could burn too, you know, depending right. on what kind of chemical it was. So I said, has sure. any chemical been put on this? And she said, no. Um, no. 
That's just the way they found it. And the other thing, they they had a uh, a rose sitting in a little vase or glass on a windowsill, and it was fine. And then all of a sudden, we went and looked at it, and it had been burnt. The rose had been burnt from the inside out, almost. Uh, right. Yeah, so, you know, definitely stuff was happening in the house. Fires, though, uh, is also a common occurrence uh, among poltergeist cases, right. too. Um, fires that are always, they're always seen, you know, they're always in a place where they're not going to do damage or they can be put out easily. But there are, you know, cases of you know, fire. Let me ask you this. Did you ever hear of anything, anyone becoming ill? Uh, because they had went into the Sally House to do an investigation uh, around the time of the of, of the episode, or I'm guessing maybe that possibly came later. Um, you know, I don't remember that. I remember, um, you know, the stuff with the hair standing on end. And again, that's something that you do find in you know the static electricity. You do find the the uh, electrical. Uh, energies and stuff. Um, I remember the hair standing up on the one cameraman and arms and legs and other people also remember the hair standing up and stuff. Um, but I, I'm trying to think. I don't remember. I, I read a little bit about uh, once they had opened up the house for private uh, paranormal investigations, people that were investigators we're going in and doing an investigation, and within a week, they were becoming uh, very ill, and a few of them had passed away from it, from the I, illness. I didn't, um, I didn't know about that. I didn't hear about that. Can't believe everything you read, but yeah, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah. And again, yeah. you know, I don't know, Dave. Um, my first thought on that is, boy, what a great way to sell books. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry. That's you know. I, you, you, you have to be skeptical in this field. You can't accept that. You have to. You can't accept uh, that a house is haunted. Get the proof. Mm -hmm. You know, make them prove that this is haunted. And I'm not I'm not saying I, I told Tim White. You know, I told viewers. Um, I'm not saying there's no little girl, girl ghost. There, there probably is. There very well could be a little girl ghost. That girl ghost is not attacking this gentleman. I'm sorry. Uh, that's BS. And I think they got it from um, some psychic that was there before I was even there. I don't know. I don't know where that where that came from. Um, but I think you know, it sure, it sure looks like yes, this little girl Sally was there. You know, was still there. Um, and the fact that Peter James, I went can't went out and found his gravestone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, her gravestone, I think. Uh, can't saw her immediately when he got to the house. Saw her in the uh, got her name without anybody telling him, you know, about it. You know, supposedly nobody told him about it. Picked up her name just like he picked up Mary, you know, um, mm -hmm. in in the case in Port Tobacco. Uh, uh, you know, Peter James was a very good psychic. A lot of guys, a lot of people I know, uh, even uh, invest, even parapsychologists, you know, he's just he's just Hollywood. He says, no, nah, he's yeah, he's Hollywood, but he's good Hollywood. He's not, you know. He's not one of these fake, uh, fake, you know, psychics. He's he knows he's doing, he knows what he's doing, and he's doing it right. He's playing it up for the television. Sure, he is. You know, he knows what good television is, but it's pretty sharp. Al, did you ever have the opportunity to uh, investigate the Queen Mary? I was uh, I was on the Queen Mary uh, once, but I didn't do an investigation on the Queen Mary. No, uh, I remember when Bill Roll, right, Bill and. Um, Tony Cornell were on the Queen Mary, right? And they picked up uh, the sounds in the, uh, like around the hull of the ship and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that? I think that was on Unsolved yeah, Mystery. Yeah, I wasn't. I know we, I, I'm almost certain sightings did. Uh, sightings, did, I think, did, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, they did. I remember. It. It before my time, though, so. I think Peter James yeah. was involved in that. Yeah, he was. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. But Unsolved familiar. Mysteries, I think, were. One of those shows, you know, before sightings, sent uh, Tom Cornell, who's a uh, parapsychologist from England, and uh, Bill Roll there. And they they captured some stuff on tape, some pretty cool stuff on tape there in, in the Queen Mary, yeah. Right. Okay. 
Now, what's your take on uh, the entity? Uh, I think it's incredible. I, you know, I. It's hard for me to comment on a case that I haven't been involved in, but um, I mean, yeah, definitely a scary case. You know, quite scary, frightening. Um, that was um, Delma Moss Group, I think, uh, at UCLA, um, that investigated it, and they got some incredible footage. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, and all I know from the case is what I little I read about it. I read about it. And um, the movie, I enjoyed the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, the entity case. Yeah, it's still a famous case. Still, you know. Right. I uh, myself, I enjoyed uh, the Smurl case as well. Yeah, I paid I a lot of attention to that one. I don't remember a lot about. I remember when it was happening. I remember the name, and I remember it was in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. Pitts, Pittsmore, something like that, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, because the same time there was a case in the Poconos where uh, a woman who had been following the small case very closely, uh, I was contacted by uh, Bill and I think by the ASPO, uh, Psych Research, um, to try to get out there. And uh, I just couldn't do it. I was very busy at work. I couldn't get out there. I was in touch with the woman a number of times and all this, but all the stuff that she was telling me sounded more like a psychological issue than anything else. And I came to find out that she, she had been um, in psychiatric care a number of times. Her whole family knew that, you know, there was something wrong with her. Um, and um, even the, they had even gotten the church involved out there, her diocese, diocese. And I actually contacted them and said, I think you need to send somebody in there to, you know, to, um, talk to this woman, you know, to, cause she was, she was equating everything. Everybody wanted to get her, um, all this stuff was happening. Um, she was hearing voices and it was more of a psychological issue than anything. But I remember she referred to the Smurl case a number of times in our correspondence. And when I got back to, uh, you know, Bill and the people I gave him the report, they said, yeah, you did the right thing. Yeah. Um, right. and I couldn't, I just couldn't get out there. It was, um, I traveled a lot. It's my job. I, I traveled overseas a lot. And so, you know, which was cool in a way because I got a chance to uh, do a, a mini investigation of uh, the 10 Bells in London, uh, one of Jack the Ripper's uh, victim haunts, you know, there. <laughs> and, you know, so I had a chance to do that. They invited me in there one time. But um, my, my God, Al, yeah, well, I'm still reading your bio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I gotta stop right now, but I'll pick, I'll pick back up right here, you know. <laughs> well, Dave, I, I appreciate you asking, asking me to be on the show. I, I you know, I. Uh, oh, like I said, Michael, man. Especially with Michael, you know. Um, yeah. 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 I, yeah I, same here. I, I appreciate the invite and having us on, Dave. Um, speaking of which, good segue because I do have to. I got to split in about ten minutes. I got to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got to go uh, get things get things ready, but um, yeah, thank you very much. This has been a, a lot of fun and great great seeing you, Al. Boy, it's been oh, great too seeing long. <laughs> yeah. Too long. You look great. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But um, all right, gentlemen. Well, yeah, it's been a pleasure, and uh, yeah, keep in touch. Let's let's do it again soon. I don't know. Yeah, I don't definitely. know what else what else I can I can bring to the table, but. I'm available, and uh, you know where to find me now, okay? Sounds sure good. thing. Love to have okay. you back. Okay. Yeah, and then, Dave, and seriously, if you need any help with uh, any of your tech stuff down the road, MP3s or whatever, just give me a holler. I'll do whatever I can to help you out, okay? I appreciate it. Okay, guys. And like I All said, right. I thank you both from the bottom of my heart. And, yeah. Uh, oh, know, wait. So oh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. So, Dave, were you a formerly a, a trooper or a, a policeman or something? No, I was with uh, Baltimore County Police and, and Fire Department, and uh, I was a private bodyguard for uh, a millionaire. Um, <laughs> I worked for Bethlehem. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Bethlehem uh, Steel uh, Sparrows Point Police. I worked for them, and uh, 
I was a bodyguard for a <clears throat> professional sports team and stuff like that. So. Oh, that's that's Very cool. cool. Well, <clears throat> my you might have caught my show. Uh, my exit my exit plan out of L.A. was a, a police chase show that was on Court TV and then True TV. Uh, Hot Pursuit. Hot Pursuit. That was my show. Wow. All police, all police chases and crazy DUI stops and all of that, all of that stuff. So anyway, yeah, I got into that after uh, when the paranormal work went away. I, I got a job on America's Funniest Videos and then Real TV and then mm -hmm. sold that show. So that's what allowed me to move up here and, you know, get the hell out of L.A., which, you know, smartest thing I ever did. My wife would tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Getting us out of there. Yeah. So very cool. Yeah, let me let me put this uh mm -hmm. this last one up here. Uh not paranormal as far as activity, but we're heading into work together. I was two minutes to a turn I needed to make in Sunday I found that I was twenty five miles from that turn I needed to make. I uh, U turned and it took I'm not seeing the rest of it. Okay. Twenty minutes to get uh, back. It sounds like a uh, Sounds like the stuff you see in ufology. Sounds yeah. like the time. Yeah. Sounds up. like they need. Sounds like they need to download the Waze app. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got. I got to show you something. I was going to mention this earlier, yeah. uh, in the broadcast. But uh, speaking of Ramblewood, when I was at <clears throat> Ramblewood, I was in the kitchen, and a few people had come in to uh, get some coffee and get something to eat a snack or two, and uh, I reached out for a paper plate, and I, for some reason, I brought it to my forehead and scratched my forehead, and one of the one of the people that was standing in the kitchen goes, look, an orb. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I did was I took... And wrote orb on it, and, and I placed it on the wall and put a pin in it, and everybody that came in loved it. And, yeah, funny. you know, I, I'm not saying that I'm against orbs, but you know, it just it just I happened, am. and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I second that. Not a big fan of orbs. Yeah, yeah I was going to say early if you see an orb floating behind me, you know, I did. <laughs> uh, you did. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you finally tied me into the show. It was a lot of fun. Yes, definitely. And like I said, I want to have you two back again, and uh, we'll talk some more. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, sounds Thanks, good. Mike. Sounds good. Okay, guys. Have a good night. Be safe. You too. Take All right. Care. Thanks okay. again. Good night. Okay, bye, Dave. Mm -hmm. Bye.